Welcome. It's our honor today to remember and celebrate the life and work of Mary Lou Martin, First Lady of Southwestern College from 1988 to 1998. Indeed, it is appropriate that we gather here, for Mary Lou made such a difference in the life of Southwestern College and in the lives of so many at this college. I do not believe that there is anyone. Thank you, Martin. I do not believe that there is anyone who better embodied who we are as builders and what we aspire to be as a college than Mary Lou. We're most grateful to Carl and family for being here and allowing us to spend this time together. Thanks to all of you for being here. I think you know that I am weeping and this uh, thing that needs to be done here, Martin. You keep going all the time. <laughs> I know you know that I am weeping and that I've wept a lot. I sobbed, sobbed, sobbed. Mary Lou and I met as freshmen in 1956. Um, I thought that I was going to study the organ, but that was a mistake. <laughs> Garth Peacock, at the end of one semester, said, Carl, I think you should follow speech and theater. <laughs> Mary Lou continued to study organ, as you know. So from 1956, Mary Lou has been a part of my life. And I am so pleased that we can be in this space, this physical space. Because we came here to study together as freshmen, and Ruby Gary cheered us on and brought us into her home gave us lots of love and affirmation. Thank you, and I appreciate the fact you will join with me in my tears. Thank you, Carl. Physical location is important. It is a vital part of how we remember who we are and how we became to be who we are. And so it's my joy to welcome you here and to invite that as we join together in this time of prayer that our minds and hearts might journey backwards across the decades and across the moments that we share with Mary Lou. I would invite you to join with me in an attitude of prayer. Merciful and holy God, we praise you for the great company of all of those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labors. We praise you for those who are dear to us, who have departed from our sight, and whom we name in our hearts before you now. Most especially, Gracious God, we lift to you our loving thanks for your servant and daughter, Mary Lou, whom you have graciously received into your presence. To all of those who we have lifted to you, O oh God, bestow your eternal peace. Welcoming and loving God, shine your perpetual light upon them and us, and bring them into the joys of your home, not made with human hands, but eternal in the heavens above. God of all life, grant to each one of us your grace, that even in the midst of our pain, we will be comforted. For those here who are filled with sorrow, restore their hope, and through the hope of Jesus Christ, our Savior, bring us all again into new life. Fill our hearts and our minds and make this time of remembrance one of healing and light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is Mary Lou. 
through and through. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart be lonely? And long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes. Just me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds rise, when song gives place to sigh, when hope within me dies, I draw the close. when I was as opposite of her as I could possibly have been. She was the wife of the president of the college. I was the wife of the college's most junior faculty member. She had two almost grown children. I had an uncontrolled one-year-old and morning sickness. <laughs> she was healthy and fit and beautiful, and I was a sloppy, tear-stained mess. And still, Still, after the very first time she walked across the street to welcome her new neighbors, I was pretty sure we were best friends. Mary Lou could do that. Take those two students from Zimbabwe who enrolled at Southwestern College a couple of decades ago. Back in those days, Southwestern didn't have a robust system for taking care of our international students. 
These two had never been on campus, or in Kansas, or in the United States. So they made their travel arrangements to fly into Chicago and figured they'd get public transportation from there. <laughs> they got as far as Newton by train, then finagled a taxi to take them the 90 minute ride down here. The taxi dumped them and their luggage out on the sidewalk at the base of the 77 at 6 a.m. And that's where they were found by the tiny blonde woman in running shorts, who was heading out for her morning power walk. Within minutes, they had been taken under the wing of Mary Lou, and a whirlwind of welcome had begun, and they were best friends from then on, and the two Zimbabweans eventually graduated. My son, Nathan, was in the Walnut Valley Youth Choir, which Mary Lou directed. Of all the impacts who had, an, of all the adults who had an impact on my firstborn, she was one of the most important. He's an attorney now, and last Saturday, having driven seven hours into the night to be before, he sat with Lyle and me at her funeral. Even though we'd been neighbors with the Martins all of his life, he didn't really know Mary Lou until his youth choir years, which fell during that fraught stage when he was leaving childhood and entering his teenage years. This is not an easy time for anyone, but it is especially difficult for a kid who is smart and sensitive and non-athletic. These years are filled with sharp things waiting to be stepped on. And still, I'm pretty sure I was convinced Mary Lou got up every morning thinking, now what can I do to make Nathan Weiner's life better today, he told us as we drove to Wichita that morning. I was a terrible singer. Looking back, I know that. But I never knew it by the way she acted. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands from every person here today who thinks Mary Lou was her best friend, but I'm confident you know what I mean. When Mary Lou talked to you, you had her full attention. I knew when she saw me and said, oh, Sarah, that she wasn't just being social, she was being real. I think there are times, though, that it's easy to lose ourselves in how real she was and forget that even the Velveteen Rabbit didn't become real without some struggle. I was reminded of that when I wrote a profile of Mary Lou for a homecoming publication at Southwestern, and this is what I wrote. If things had been different, Mary Lou Bauer might very well have become president of Southwestern College. <laughs> <laughs> she was, in the words of her husband, the person in whose life the Southwestern story is told most eloquently. She came from a small town and with embarrassment admits that she didn't have a plan for what she wanted to do with her life. But she threw herself wholeheartedly into the Southwestern community. Master Builder, May Queen, Homecoming Queen, Who's Who, Honors Graduate with a degree in Organ Performance, and, as a junior, co-campaign manager for the winning candidate for student body president, Carl Martin. <laughs> Only a year later, just after Mary Lou completed her senior recital on the stage of Richardson Auditorium, Carl proposed. And they were married soon after their graduation in 1960. If things had been different, if she had a different gender, or if she had graduated a few decades later, Mary Lou might have gone on to be president of Southwestern. She was that hardworking, that smart, that committed to the ideals of the college. Instead, Mary Lou became one of the most beloved first ladies in the history of the college. Between 1988 and 1999, 1998, she was the institution's premier supporter, its gracious host, its ardent defender. It wasn't always an easy task to be the trailing spouse of a man as capable and intense as Karl Martin. <laughs> he had become a pastor after graduating from Southwestern. For Mary Lou, a self-declared feminist whose personal heroes included Gloria Steinem and Carol Gilligan. The stereotypical persona of the pastor's wife didn't settle easily. The knowledge that, as a United Methodist pastor, her husband would change churches routinely over the years and she would be expected to uproot her family li family's lives was unsettling. She told me, those first years as the wife of the pastor, I didn't have my identity carved out yet. In those years, I gained confidence to be my own person, to step out beyond the traditional roles. I had to learn what I was, what I could offer, how not to people please so much. It took several years of study and reflection and many hours of deep conversations before Mary Lou discovered what she calls her voice. By then, Carl and Mary Lou's two children, Andrew and Megan, were old enough to perform in the church's children's musicals. And Mary Lou, with her degree in organ performance, that wasn't going to get me anywhere, 
realized she had not only talent, but also passion for public school music teaching. It's my profession, what I own, she said. Over the years, she taught in Great Bend, Bueller, Arkansas City, Winfield, and Wichita. The Martins were back in Winfield frequently over the years, not only as visitors, but as part of the community when Carl was chaplain at Southwestern, and again when he was district superintendent of the church, and finally when he was appointed president of the college. This final stay in Winfield, as the wife of the president, brought opportunities for even more growth. During these years, she founded and conducted the Walnut Valley Youth Choir, and auditioned 80 voice group of children from throughout the area. During its seven years of existence, it became an award-winning organization that drew packed audiences to its concerts in Richardson Auditorium. Mary Lou was like the snake charmer, one parent marvel. A kid's body could be wiggling, but his eyes never left her. <laughs> she gave up the youth choir when Carl announced his resignation from the presidency. After 10 years, during a critical time of Southwestern's history, when hard decision followed hard decision, both of them were tired. So the Martins moved to Wichita. Mary Lou continued to teach after they moved there, then spent five years part-time with arts partners, then continued in retirement as a docent for the Wichita Art Museum. As I look back on my life, she said, I have such gratitude, that's such an inadequate word, for this institution, what it's meant in my life and my family's life, and for the opportunities to grow and learn and stretch and be challenged. And I was able to do that in an accepting and positive environment. Not everybody gets that opportunity. She could have been president, but she became something better. She became herself. Last Friday night, when friends and families gathered before the service in Mary Lou's church in Wichita, Andy challenged us to write on a card one word that described Mary Lou. I collected those cards, and, and each one of them described her perfectly, because she was so many things. A musical ambassador, a gentle soul, enthusiastic, witty, and imp, which was my favorite. Wasn't she just beautiful? And so many more. There's a verse in the Bible that says we must work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, and I would extend that to say that we must work out our own lives the same way. Mary Lou studied, she explored, she mined her own depths to work out her own life, and oh, what good work she did. She was my neighbor, she was my boss's wife, she still is the person I want to be when I grow up. And she was, as she was for all of you, my best friend. True confession. I fell in love when I was 10 years old. The first weekend of May, 1960, at Southwestern College, May Fate. Singing, music, dancing around the Maypole, it was very theatrical. <laughs> Beautiful couples of SC students, May Queen attendants, processed down the 77 steps. Women arrayed in pastel spring formals and handsome young men in white dinner jackets, followed by the May Queen, Mary Lou Bauer. I had never seen such embodiment of beauty in my entire 10 years. <laughs> Would she wait for me? <laughs> Ruby Gary, the SC librarian, leaned over to tell my mother, Mary Lou goes with Carl Martin, I bet they get married. <laughs> oh! I had seen Carl Martin in campus player plays. He was good. He was handsome. What chance did I have? <laughs> Ten years later, a student at Southwestern, still single, Carl Martin, married, was the chaplain. I took one of his classes, Christian Faith. I really liked it. I got an A, really. I was a good student, inquisitive. I always wanted to ask him, could I meet your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Forward 20 years, married myself with three boys, having captured a beauty of my own, now returning as a faculty at Southwestern together with Allison. We moved in June for summer theater 
and the new president was announced in July. It was Karl Martin. And his wife was, ta-da! <laughs> we got to meet Mary Lou Martin and know her, and instantly, as Sarah says, she was our best friend. She was caring, spunky, artful, funny, gracious, a human outpouring of love. She was so polite. She never asked me why. I stared at her with this strange, adoring, prepubescent puppy look. <laughs> Mary Lou and Carl opened their hearts and home to students and faculty families, picnics and parties. They hosted the annual campus player banquet in their home. So beautiful, filled with art, spilling out and up the 77 steps as Mary Lou lined them with paper Christmas luminaries on opening night while it snowed at Eager Heart. She filled the college community with art, living life with such fullness, but never to be too busy to be fully present with anyone. She inspired us to stop our busyness to look at our lives and really appreciate each other and the world through music and art and theater, but in every moment, to see beauty, the struggles, and how silly we are when we think our lives and work are too important to take the time to care about each other and our world. And that's an art. On early morning walks, Allison would meet Mary Lou power walking picking up debris cast off by people too busy to care about the world as she sped home to throw it away or recycle. And Allison was soon carrying a bag. And their kids. In college, Megan is senior at SE, smart, talented, a pixie-ish beauty all her own, auditioned for Shaw's Arms and the Man, playing the smart and saucy maid. I had seen Carl in that show when I was 11. He was dashing, though I was a bit critical because I was jealous for other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wrap up. Oh, oh, Andy, their son, K-State, the other purple school. Or were you out by then? Um, the embodiment of talent and somehow the spirit of both his mother and his father acted. And I had the chance to act and interact with him on and off stage in My Fair Lady in the summer of 1990. And it made us all proud to live on the street where their family lived. Mm -hmm. Okay, wrap up. In the fall of 1994, I dared to ask Carl and Mary Lou if they would like to do a show together. Love Letters by A.R. Gurney. A two-person reader's theater play about two passionate, gifted, troubled individuals who grow up as neighbors and friends, live, love, struggle, and marry someone else. They play the play is a series of letters written by the man and the woman and then read as they have lived them throughout their lives until her death. They said yes. And so those rehearsals are one of my most <coughs> treasured experiences in theater at Southwestern or throughout my life. We worked, talked, cried, laughed. Why are they doing that? saying that. What is wrong with it? Carl would say, well, there are several th reasons. We, we probably can agree, Mary Lou would look over her glasses, uh, oh, we, we would probably agree, Carl, maybe we don't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we don't agree. Uh, we all struggle through it till we figure it out. The play ends with the letters he, Carl, writes to the woman's mother after her death. Alice and I were going to read a bit of that last letter and her response from beyond, but we're not going to because I'm not going to cry. Allison and I ask how Mary Lou and Carl did what they did individually and together. At home, at work, at play, and in the community. So artfully. And how their kids came out so good. Uh, the way Mary, Mary Lou and Carl impacted our lives together in marriage. They became models for us, 
for our coldness, and they still are. So, to all of us, to our world, from us, we say thank you. And I have to admit it, Carl, you deserve it. <laughs>
and Stephen, that was beautiful. Thank you. The truth through music, uh, I think a concept that, that Mary Lou understood so well. Sit up, children. Don't fidget. Eyes with me. And as someone reminded me last night, one or two. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to call yourself one of Mary Lou's children, you probably just stirred in your seat a little bit. In 1992, at the ripe age of 10, my fifth grade music teacher, who happened to be an alumnus of Southwestern College, told me about a choir that was just for kids like me. The Walnut Valley Youth Choir was a relatively new group but was already coming to some regional acclaim. I was an aspiring yet untested young singer. I was submitted to my very first audition in an effort to become part of this elite group. My first rehearsal now feels more like a dream. Nearly 70 of us filed in, parents in tow. Within minutes, we had been assigned seats and we were sitting orderly and ready for directions. This was Mary Lou's magic. As if the Pied Piper had played his tune week after week, Mary Lou brought us together and we made music. Mary Lou influenced so many of us. She showed us how to listen, how to really listen. She built us up. Constantly, constantly telling us what wonderful people we were. How special this group of young people was and how much she appreciated our effort. I'll never forget her words when we did an especially good job. Oh, this is nice. <laughs> When I was asked to speak about Mary Lou, I genuinely thought to myself, oh, this will be easy to think of wonderful things to say about her. The more I reflected, however, the harder it proved to find the right words to share. Certainly, there are words that can be used, but it seems that they all fall miserably short. It feels as if someone has asked me to describe the Sistine Chapel to someone who cannot see. Yes, I can find words to tell of the images, but will they ever do justice to the beauty that's been imprinted on this world? That's our Mary Lou. How could we ever measure the ripples she left on us? Maybe the people gathered here today are the appropriate yardstick. Being asked to speak here about my time in the Walnut Valley Youth Choir is one of the greatest honors that I've experienced. I consider myself very lucky. Lucky to have been one of Mary Lou's kids, and even more lucky to have reconnected with her two years ago. Not many of us get to meet our heroes. I did. When I saw Mary Lou for the first time in 18 years, I was taken aback. What do you say to someone who has made such a permanent impression on your life? I reintroduced myself. She greeted me with a hug. How could I ever show my appreciation? How could I ever tell her how much it meant? Some of you may know that this past summer, I, along with great help from many other Walnut Valley Youth Choir alumni and friends, we dedicated a bench for Mary Lou right across the way at the mound. The plaque on that bench reads, Honoring Mary Lou Martin, <coughs> Walnut Valley Youth Choir, from your students and fans. Mary Lou and Carl came down for the dedication. I was once again lucky. I got to sit with Mary Lou on her bench and survey the mound. 
Mary Lou leaned over to me and she took my hand and she said, Oh, Charles, this is nice. <laughs> a week or so ago, as I was walking here across campus, I took a moment and I stopped by the mound and I sat. As I paused there, I could sense our Mary Lou with me. As I surveyed the beauty of campus, I said to myself, this is nice. Mary Lou, I hope that I will always live up to the high standards you set for me. I will work hard, make beautiful things, and try to appreciate the nice that surrounds me each and every day. Thank you for blessing my life. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin so easily that trips us up. Let us run with the endurance the race God has set before us. I remember last Saturday, I went to two great funerals. First at 1030 here in Winfield for Reverend Ernest McClure, and it was a phenomenal service. Then I got in my car, and I drove up to Wichita, and went to another service, so very different from the first, but still extraordinary. I wept through both. Two very different people, but two people that have especially blessed Winfield. I went home, planning to go to the football game, but I fell asleep and I was exhausted. Just to be surrounded by such great crowd of witnesses that I feel that surround this place. I'm in my 22nd year and I know my family thinks, what are you doing down there, girl? <laughs> but I say to them, there is just something special about Winfield in Southwestern. It's in the air. It's in the buildings, and it's especially in the people. So I started in my remembrance, and I started thinking of all the great women that I knew that have come through this place. Man, I had a great time. I decided I was going to build my own Mount Rushmore, and I was going to call it the Mount Mushmore, and then it got kind of silly. <laughs> so I thought of four women that I have met since I've been here in Winfield and at Southwestern that have just transformed me. Pauline Nichols. I met her when I first was here. Vera King, Fran Broadhurst, and when I say it, I just smile. And then there's Mary Lou. Now I'm a research nerd, please forgive me, and so I like to analyze things and evaluate stuff and give people little funky chunks of knowledge to remember. So I had posted a picture and a remark about Mary Lou on my Facebook page, and I analyzed it. This is what I found. Although she was loved by all, and clearly men had crushes on her that lasted a lifetime, <laughs> she was particularly captivating for women. As Sarah said, she was like your best friend. When she spoke about your name and said, Dawn, you just felt like you'd been kissed by an angel. She was one of those rare people that you could just call by her first name and everybody knew who you were talking about. It was Mary Lou. You'd pause and smile afterwards and feel just that you understood and that the people that really knew her knew exactly how special she was. She was frequently described in so many incredible words. Amazing, kind, wonderful, classy, first class, exquisite, beautiful in every way, or my favorite, the world has lost a beautiful soul. When women spoke of her, they spoke about how they felt when they were with her. She treated me with respect, was repeated over and over again. Always made me feel like I was loved and accepted, a joy to my heart. She kissed my cheek and told me to tell my family I. But my first personal favorite 
was written by a alum, young alum that wrote on a Facebook page. She wrote this. The epitome of kindness, patience, talent, warmth, enthusiasm, dedication, beauty, strength, passion, compassion, inspiration, and in capital letters, love. Dear Mary Lou, I pray for your peace and every blessing in paradise. You are all the things as a mentor. I can only believe that you are also all these as a wife, a mother, and friend. May your legacy live onto those who knew and loved you. Amen. So I thought, okay, what, what is it about her? How do you capture that? How do I grow up and be that? How do I, how do I get all that stuff? And so, again, me being a nerd, forgive me. There's a theory, and it's called grit, and it's, um, uh, it was proposed by a, um, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And she describes what are the ingredients that make the most extraordinary people extraordinary? What is it? What have they got that the rest of us don't have? And there's four things. The first is a unique level of talent. Not just good, not just great, but unique. Sustained passion. Without quitting, without complaining, without stopping. Hard work and focused, practiced on your most difficult or weakest trait. And you gotta do that every day, without fail, for at least 10 years before you have the potential <laughs> to realize your greatness. Now, Dr. Duckworth's theory is, is okay. And okay, she's been on TED talking and YouTube, and I haven't, but I'm gonna criticize hers for a second. Because <laughs> she hasn't met Mary Lou. So I'm gonna tweak it. There are six qualities that I think are required. I get the unique level of talent and smarts. She has that. She has clearly sustained passion. She has hard work and practice. But she's got three more things that the rest don't have. It's not just 10 years of work. It's a lifetime. 77 years of lifetime of commitment. And of course, She's Southwestern College educated. That means that you're a part already right there. <laughs> and then lastly, she has that je ne sais quoi, inspired by God, that's special, that's just, a, just something that you just have. So this is Mary Lou. And when I think of her, I think of her like she's Julie Andrews. And she's on top of the mountain. And she's singing, climb every mountain. Forge every stream, follow every rainbow, till you find your dream. Thank you, Mary Lou.
We have gathered today with great admiration and gratitude and love in our hearts. We have, all of us, been blessed. After the benediction, we invite everyone uh, to remain uh, in our seats as the family recesses to the south reading room, and then we invite everyone uh, to greet the family in the reading room after the service. Thank you. Friends, there is a song. There is a song. Can you hear it? It is a song from God Almighty, sung by the clouds of witnesses, the choirs of witnesses. It's a little more orderly. It's a lot more beautiful now. May we carry forth that song. May you be comforted by the peace of God that surpasses all of our own understanding. May your hearts and minds be filled with the peace of God Almighty. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with all of you now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.